How can you keep your puppy from killing your chickens? What is the perfect kind of property to look for when you're going to buy a property for homesteading? And what even is a homestead versus a farm versus a ranch anyway? We're gonna answer those questions and a whole lot more in today's episode of Ask Homesteading. <laughs> I got a hat here. I'll leave it on. It's time for Ask Homesteady. If you want to get a question answered on our weekly Q&A shows, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is leave a question in the comments below any of our YouTube videos and add hashtag one word ask homesteady. Not two words, not hashtag ask, ask homesteady one word. We get asked hundreds of questions every week. We try to answer as many as possible, and the best way to ensure your question will be answered on this, live, on this weekly show is to add the hashtag. That way I can find it every Friday when I sit down to do Ask Home Study. We have some really good questions for today's Ask Home Study. Let's dive right in. It has been a few weeks since we did an Ask Home Study. Last week we did a live show and uh, we asked as many questions, we answered as many questions as we could, probably asked a few too, <laughs> on the live show. Uh, so we're gonna be going back in time today, a few videos back in time. First one, uh, the question was asked on the video where we were showing what we were doing for mineral feeding our cows. The question was about our puppies. Our viewer noticed that our dogs are in crates in the barn and they asked Krista Wild, why are the dogs in these small cages? Good question, Krista. I think it's Krista. We crate train our labs. Labs are a great breed for a homestead dog. If you want a dual purpose dog, one that you can use on the homestead uh, to keep predators away, uh, just have a dog presence kind of security, and also a field dog, something you can, a dog you could take out hunting with you. I do a lot of deer hunting, I do a lot of bird hunting, and the lab is a great dog for tracking, find, finding wild game where it is legal, in the ways that it is legal. And so I have labs, that's why I choose labs. Now labs are a very smart breed, not all labs are smart, but you can get very smart labs if you find a good line of lab. As we have, our dogs are smart dogs, and what I have been told by people with much more experience, much better trained dogs than mine who have been doing this for years, have won awards for training labs, the breeder that I purchased my dogs from, uh, labs do well with some time to think. Kind of like us, right? You go and you learn a new skill. You want to learn how to, um, you know, build a whittle something. So you learn the skill of whittling and you take some time and you do it and you make a few mistakes, you get frustrated and then you stop doing it. You take time off from it and then the next day you go back and you start whittling again and wow look at that you're a little bit better. You didn't practice overnight your, time, your brain needed some time to mull it over. A lot of people could relate to this, the idea of mulling something over. Labs when you teach them uh, seem to do better. Some people have found that they do better with small frequent training sessions and in between that time they go into their crate where they're not being distracted, where they're not having outside influence on them, where they can think about what they've done. And that frequent training sessions with crate time has proven to help a lab learn more. And the person I've learned that from, the breeder, uh, his labs know so many commands, just so more commands than you could imagine. He can tell his dogs all kinds of things and they will do them based off the word. So I trust that opinion because I've seen his dogs at work. That's not the only reason we put our dogs in crates. Another is because labs are hunting dogs or tracking dogs. If they pick up a scent, they will go and find it. And if I'm right there with a whistle in my mouth, I can stop them from doing that. But if they're running around outside without me there, and without a collar on, like an e-collar to keep them within a boundary, uh, they'll be gone. So I don't let my labs run around throughout the day when I'm not there to watch them. Uh, the only time that my labs are allowed to be out and not in their crates full time is if they're inside with us. And uh, when they're inside with us, they still at times will be in their crate if I want them in their crate to think about what they've done. Crate 
tests are not a bad thing for a lab. Any, no different than your own bed is not bad for you to be in. Uh, my crates are the right sizes for my dog so they can get up, they can turn around, they can change positions in their crates. You don't want a small crate where they can't do that. Uh, but just like your own bed where you go and lie at night is just big enough for you to roll over once or twice and uh, that's not confining. If you were to put walls around your bed like a crate, it still wouldn't be confining. It'd be where you rest and where you mull over your day and sleep and dream. So it's not a bad thing for our dogs. We feed them in there. It's a safe space, a happy space for them. And finally, it is an incredibly nice thing to have if you go to other people's houses, if you're staying with friends on a vacation, going to a vacation home, to have a crate trained dog, either for your house sitter who's watching your dog, or for you, if you take your dog with you, you can put them in their crate so they don't damage the house you're in. Crate training is a great tool for anyone who is training their lab. I can't say this to be true for other breeds. I don't have experience with other breeds. But if you have a lab, uh, be sure to start them early with crate training because it's awesome to have a crate trained dog and it's not bad for them any more than it's bad for you to lay in your own bed and uh, rest and relax. So I hope that answers your question, Krista. Let's go to the next one. Another dog question, and this is one I think that will help a lot of people. Deanna asks, do you have any advice on how to keep a four month old puppy from killing chickens? She has killed four so far. Yes, Deanna, I have some great advice. Crate train your dog. <laughs> like I just talked about, crate training is an effective tool to confine your dog so they are not getting into trouble when you're not there to oversee them. There is no way, no how you should be leaving a four month old puppy with your chickens unsupervised because a puppy cannot be trained at four months not to kill chickens. It, any training you do for this puppy, um, you can start training your puppy not to kill chickens, we'll talk about that in a second, but it will not get to the point at four months old where you can trust it with a chicken un, unobserved. And what you're doing, if you leave your puppy unobserved, unwatched with chickens, is you're just creating a problem. You're creating a dog that's going to be a problem for you for probably ever. So let's start with how to teach your puppy not to be interested in your chickens. You do supervised interaction, your puppy and your chickens. So get your puppy on a leash. I use an English lead when training my labs. An English lead uh, does tighten around the neck, but not like a choking collar. It tightens from the back, which scruffs them like a mother dog would do, <laughs> bite in their back of their neck to correct them. You'll see a mother dog do that with her pups, go no, and she'll kind of bite them on the back of the neck, not to hurt them, but just to teach them no, we don't do that. An English lead does the same thing, scruffs them from the back of the neck. You can purchase them on Amazon. Of course, if you do your shopping on Amazon, type in amsteady.com first. We'll forward you on Amazon and we'll get a bonus for sending you there. Uh, walk your dog on your English lead through your chicken run. And every time that dog starts to show interest in your chickens, you give it a tug. This is your puppy, you give it a tug, good firm tug, and you say no and you get it to look at something else. No, you don't want your puppy interested in those chickens. I even do this with my bird dogs. It doesn't ruin their hunting drive. They just learn that these birds are my birds. They're not to be messed with. When I go out in the field and I tell you, hunt them up, you can mess with those birds. If I tell you, hunt them up with my own birds, you can mess with those birds. But you'd start teaching them that these are mine and you don't show interest in these. You walk them around, no, no. Uh, another great tool I have found for training pups not to do things you don't want them to do without hurting them, like a zapping collar or an electric collar, um, a squirt gun. I'm going to do a video on this soon. I'm going to show you how I've been using a little squirt gun. I learned this trick from our friends from a couple videos ago, Coon and Jane. Uh, they use the squirt gun to keep their dog from jumping up. It doesn't hurt them, a little water in the nose, it's annoying, it makes them stop doing what they're doing. So walk around your chicken yard with a little squirt gun in your pocket, and when she goes for those chickens, tch -tch, no. And I use that sound, you'll hear me use that tch -tch. Uh, So they associate the squirt or the tug with that negative noise, and that way when I'm caught off guard, a chicken flies over the fencing, and I'm walking around the yard, and 
there goes the puppy. I can just go ch -ch -ch. and it's funny when I say that to Poppy now she'll wet, she'll like wipe her face with her paws thinking she got sprayed even if I didn't spray her. So it's teaching her when she hears that noise ch -ch -ch, I'm correcting her and uh, it's not a command she can disobey which we'll get to with another question later today. A lot of dog training questions. Walk her around the barn. No, no, no. Then put her in her crate. Keep her away from your chickens. Don't leave a four month old puppy unsupervised with chickens. As they get older and they learn better, generally speaking, if you've done a good job with this basic training in the beginning, you can trust them more. I still would not leave my labs unattended in the chicken area all day long. However, I would walk around with my older lab bones in the barn and he would be fine. He might sneak an egg though. I, uh, I definitely would expect him to sneak an egg, but he won't touch the chickens. If I'm within sight of him, if I'm not within sight of him, but it's just we're out working around and he's sneaking around the barn looking for eggs, uh, he will not harm the chickens. But I do not leave him unattended in there all day long because that's just asking for trouble. Maybe you get a wounded chicken, something stuck in a fence that gets scared and flutters. I don't think a lab is capable of, of being with your animals. Now, I don't know what breed you have, you didn't say. Uh, so perhaps you have a breed that at some point could be capable of being with the birds. But judging by her track record so far, I would say that's probably not going to happen. Now here's the bad news. They've already killed four chickens. It's going to be hard to get this dog to stop. She enjoys it. Maybe she's tasted chicken blood. Uh, maybe she's eaten some chicken. That doesn't mean she's a lost cause. It just means you're going to up your power for training this dog if this is necessary. So the final tool you can use, and I do not suggest using this on puppies. They're not ready for it. Just control your puppy, keep her in a crate, keep her separate from the chickens. On an older dog, uh, after they lose their puppy teeth is what I've been suggested by the dog trainers and breeders I've worked with. Uh, then they're ready to handle negative reinforcement more than just a squirt gun or a jerk on the leash. This is where the e-collar comes into play. Now before you think I'm a mean person because I use an e-collar with my dog, don't forget I use an electric fence with my cows, I use an electric fence on my goats, I use electric fence on my chickens. It works the exact same way. It gives them a small nick or shock, startles them, and if you do it properly with the proper modern tools, it doesn't hurt them. It doesn't have to hurt them. Uh, it may, with your, we'll talk about your instance in a minute here, it may get to the point where you need to introduce a stronger shock. But shocking animals with a little bit of electricity, little prick, is a much better outcome than euthanizing your dog because it kills other animals or giving her away because you can't get her to stop doing what she's learned she likes to do. So a little bit of electric nick or shock is not the end of the world. We use it on all our livestock. The dog is no different. Get yourself a e-collar. The e-collars these days come with a dial, zero to 10. That is the power that you can up or down your collar. And that's not to hurt your dog more. The reason that's there is, becomes, is because some dogs respond to a much lighter nick, mostly because of their coat, the time of year, uh, their size versus other dogs. For example, my labs are more sensitive to the nick than the German Shepherd who's on the property. He has more hair, more fur, I should say, and uh, it's harder for that nick to get through all that insulation. That's what the dial's for. It's not to hurt them more. Also, if your dog is more distracted, he will not notice the nick as much on a lower number. So here's what you do. You take your dog out and you walk around, you let him forget that he has the collar on. Leave it on for a day, don't do anything, maybe two days. Let him get used to the collar. Walking around, walking around. Then, with the dial set to one, while you're outside walking with the dog, he's distracted, push the button and watch your dog. On number one, he probably won't do anything. Dial it up to number two, push the button. Three, somewhere around three, four, or five, you're gonna notice your dog start to tilt his head a little bit. He doesn't like that feeling. It doesn't hurt him. It's just like when you have a gentle, if you've ever been hooked up to an electric pulsing thing, maybe for your back or something, uh, tenses the muscles, he's not gonna like it. And so he's gonna go like this. And that's your starting point. You now know if your dog goes like this at three, 
that's where you start. It's not hurting him, it's just bothering him a little bit, which hopefully will be enough to get him to stop messing with the chickens. You never want to go a lot further past that point. Now if your dog is chasing a chicken and you put it on a three and you hit that button and he doesn't or she doesn't respond, it's because she's distracted and she isn't noticing that as she's running excitedly chasing a chicken. You will then want to dial that up. However, you don't want to dial it to 10 and have your dog yelping in pain. You go incrementally, three to four, four to five, five to six. Uh, the highest I've ever seen a dog need is a seven. I've never seen a dog need a 10, but your dog might be different but you don't want to be hurting your dog. You don't want him audibly yelping. Another good thing to do, this can be a little different if you're training like I am a bird dog, but if you're just training a dog not to go for any birds, any chickens, then as much as you have to do with this last straw training is let your dog go into the chicken coop. As soon as they start to get interested in a chicken, nick him. If she doesn't respond, up the number, nick him again. And as soon as that dog turns away and runs, stop the nick. You hold the button and it continues. Stop as soon as they lose interest. Now you're training your dog. If I show interest in this thing, I get that weird sensation I don't like. But if I turn away, it stops. Another important step to this is for you not to be visible when this happens. Hide in your barn, hide in your house. They're wireless, these e-collars, so you don't need uh, to be close. You can, your dog, you want your dog not to realize it's you or the collar that's doing the work. So putting the collar on days ahead, not letting them associate the collar with the pain and not letting them associate you with the pain is important. That's all you need to do. It's more complicated if you're training a bird dog, but we won't talk about that in that video because you didn't ask about training a bird dog not to go after chickens. Uh, we'll leave it at that. Don't beat the dog with a dead chicken, dead frozen chicken. Don't beat the dog physically. Don't tie the dog up in the chicken run and beat the dog. The e-collar is minimal to no pain. At most, usually it's just a mild discomfort. It's quick, it's effective, and it really does work. I've used it to train multiple dogs not to go after chickens. However, ideally, like bones, if you start them young and you work them all the way up, I've never had to e-collar bones for one of my farm birds. That's never been necessary because we started young and he got the idea. Hope that helps your chicken killing problem. And remember, don't put an e-collar on a puppy till she loses her puppy teeth, which for labs is around six months, but might be different for your dog. Uh, until then, just contain your dog and don't want to kill chickens. I know that went really long, but I wanted to try to help you solve this problem because nobody likes having their dog killing their animals. It's not fun and we don't have that problem. Our dogs don't kill our chickens. Carla wants to know, are you going to buy more cows or are you just going to breed Ladybug and Luna to get your bigger herd? Carla, we don't have any plans of buying more cows right now. Our current plan is to breed Ladybug and Luna. That'll give us two more and those two more, I'd like to probably keep maybe three cows here. The only reason we would consider buying another, and when this would happen would be after Ladybug and Luna's next calving, we could take the money from that sale of those calves and use it to buy another cow who did not have the same genetics as Ladybug and Luna. It always is a good idea as you grow your herd to bring in new genetics because with those new genetics comes new good things. <laughs> you know, if Ladybug and Luna have these, they're very similar genetics because She's her calf. Luna is Ladybug's calf. Uh, another cow of different genetics might bring some pros in that maybe Ladybug and Luna are deficient in. So that would be the only reason to do that. But we have no immediate plans to do that. In our last Q&A, Ask the Cowgirl, we talked about the scenario of having a milk cow that was no longer productive. Would we actually call her? And by calling her, really, what we're talking about is killing and eating that cow. And we talked about how a younger milk cow who was not productive in that she could not be bred after multiple tries and, and doing everything we could, finding this cow could not be bred. Um, what would we do with that younger cow versus an older cow? So we already talked about how an older cow that we've for years had production from, we would let that older cow just retire out on the pasture. But a like four year old 
Like, if Ladybug couldn't be bred, if we tried and tried and tried and she just wouldn't be bred again, what would we do? Uh, we said we would probably wind up culling her and eating her if at like four years old she stopped being productive. We got a few questions on that kind of follow up on that. Elisa, uh, who is often on the Ask Home Study and a very big supporter of the Home Study show, uh, she says, Would you cull Ladybug if she was still milking in this scenario? So that's a good question. Right now, Ladybug is in milk and we're planning on continuing her in milk until she is far along in her next pregnancy. So if we continue to milk Ladybug, you can keep milking a cow. If you keep milking the cow, they'll keep in milk. Uh, then there would not be the same drive. She would still be productive. The only problem with that is we do ourselves like the idea of drying a cow off for a couple months and taking a break from milking. Uh, it's Kay who does all the hand milking and she would like a couple months off. And that's one of those things you look forward to if you do hand milking and it's not your business, it's just a hobby, uh, taking a few months and not worrying about going out and milking and just letting your cows out on the pasture. So while we would not wind up culling a cow that was in milk at the time, eventually we would be drying that cow off to get a break. And at that point, if she would not be rebred and she was a younger cow, I think what we said would still hold weight. Uh, we would at that point probably wind up culling that cow and uh, using her meat, eating that cow. And later on, if we had no cows at that point, getting a new line of dairy cows on the farm, more than likely with our situation, we would already have a cow in, in milk and that one would just be called out of the herd because of the fact that it was not a good uh, genetic line to continue because it wouldn't be continued, it wouldn't be bred. Lisa also asked uh, if she didn't want to become a homesteady pioneer but she wanted to just donate something to the channel, uh, where should she go to do this? Uh, we never ask for donations because I believe in providing value for value. Uh, however, from time to time people do not want the homesteady pioneer program, they don't shop through Amsteady, uh, but they'd like to just give something because they find value in our videos that we put out on YouTube every day for free to watch. And uh, so I did share, and I will put in the links below, a link to a site where you can, our website, you can go there and you can donate. We don't ask for donations. If you'd like to support the show, shop through the Amsteady link. You're getting value in the things you're purchasing and we're getting value in a bonus for sending you there. And if you want bonus content and discounts to homesteading things, uh, classes I used to teach, you can become a homesteady pioneer. There's a link below for that. It's just five bucks a month, which for our daily, weekly show, sorry, with our daily show, uh, that comes out to about a quarter per episode. So if you think each one of these videos, if you watch them and you would say, hey man, great video, bing, toss me a quarter, you can do that once a month in the form of $5. And that is the biggest way to support this channel. We would not be doing the show right now without the pioneers because we couldn't. We just couldn't make enough money from the actual YouTube money uh, to do this full time. So thank you so much if you are a pioneer. Uh, it has meant the difference of this being a full time thing. And if you're not, but you'd like to help support the show, we'd really appreciate it. Link below for that. Let's go on to the next question. Brenda had a good question. She read an article, not a study. That's a good point. There's a difference between an article and a study. Um, I try to f base most of what we do off of studies. Not all, always. Science is not infallible. Science is not perfect. But I like to have some solid basis for making decisions. Uh, she says she read this article that talked about uh, parasites, worms, gastrointestinal parasites that are in the belly of a goat or a sheep can't survive in the stomach of cattle and vice versa. And so multi-species grazing may decrease internal parasite loads. She says, I hope it's true uh, because she's been doing it and planning on doing it more. So Brenda, I have heard this same information. Now I don't have a uh, scientific study off the top of my head to back this up. Uh, however, I've talked to many people who mentioned the fact that mo for the most part, worms who live in one stomach of one animal cannot survive into the stomach of another one. And so yes, multi-species grazing 
uh, many do believe that it is a effective way to control worms, especially on a smaller homestead-like situation. So to do this effectively, you would want to put one group through and then another group through and then another group through. If you have any scientific information pro or con that, uh, I haven't found anything, doesn't mean it's not out there, uh, just means I haven't found it yet, link in the comments below. Just if you have a scientific study to share, that's great. Uh, if it's always worked for you, that means it could be the reason why or there could be a different reason why. Um, and that we talk about a lot in these more videos where we talk about science, how anecdotal evidence doesn't mean it is wrong. It also doesn't mean it's right. So it seems to make sense. I've heard it from a lot of very educated people, uh, but I have not found the scientific before this video, I did not go and look for it. So it might be just a couple clicks away. Oftentimes I use Google Scholar to find uh, studies or I will search the words, the keywords and then put scientific study to find if there's actually been studies on it. And I usually will avoid using like a blogger or a vlogger's word. Rather, if they have the words there and then quote their sources, I will follow through to the sources to see what the sources have said. Generally, I find that's the best way to find the more scientific data out there. Now, that's not to discount old world um, practices. There are, is and are value to um, traditionally how things have been done from time to time. And so if it's something that's been done, a practice that's been done by many people, uh, usually there is some merit to it, but not necessarily as much merit as you're banking on. And a good example of that, when we had our veterinarian uh, YouTuber Cody Creelman on during the worm episode, we talked about uh, some old world treatments for worms. He talked about how tobacco, uh, his grandfather used to use a handful of tobacco, feed his animals that, and that helped with worms. He said, while it may help actually, it's not as effective as the most scientific um, products that are now available. So long-winded way of saying, Brenda, that's something a lot of people do. I don't have the scientific study link below to prove it, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work. So, And uh, finally, your question on our fencing is we are working on our fencing. We have a video coming out soon that talks about some issues we're having with fencing the cows and what we're gonna be doing into the next season. There were a lot of questions on worms. A chicken gal says, since goats get worms more often, if I have goats with my dairy cow, can she get worms from them somehow? Chicken gal, similar answer to the last um, question, which is probably not because the worms that are living in the goat aren't living in the cow, probably. Uh, but again, there's a lot of different parasites out there. There's a lot of different worms you're dealing with. And that's not always the case. And the example I could use is uh, there are warnings for people walking around where your livestock are. If you're walking barefoot, if you're dealing with livestock and not washing your hands, people can get those worms. So it's not always the case that from what I've read that you can't pass it from species to spe or, uh, yeah, species to species. So worms, as we found when we were doing the research for our videos, it's, uh, you can dedicate your whole life studying gastrointestinal parasites. There's a lot of data, a lot of information out there. And uh, to cover it all in just a quick Q&A on YouTube isn't the best way to do it. So here's an interesting question, kind of question. Um, it's about inbreeding or line breeding. We talked about, we just kind of quickly mentioned this in a previous video, uh, breeding animals to other animals in the same line. And we mentioned it was line breeding. And Terry Beth Reed said, inbreeding is never a good idea. It's the same as in humans. You pass along too many bad genetics when inbreeding. And then Brenda says, ask Homesteady, interesting question, line breeding. I believe that it is different than inbreeding we have a beef bull that has worked well for us, but this year we allowed him to access his daughters. Can't figure out if I'm going to regret this decision. In any case, he's going to be switched out this year. I don't think that the bird in hand reasoning is best plan for deciding about the herd bull, but it sure was handy to allow him to stay another breeding season. Okay, so 
Brenda's the one who really asked it. Terry Beth just said it's never a good idea, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, Brenda is asking, was it okay for them to do? Or are they going to regret it? So let's talk about first inbreeding and line breeding. There, uh, I, I heard a saying which is pretty good about this. When a farmer lets the sire access his daughters, so the sire bull uh, mates with some of his progeny there, some calves that are his, and it turns out good, they call it line breeding, and when it turns out bad, they call it inbreeding. Essentially, line breeding is a form of inbreeding. So inbreeding being when you take the same genetic line and you have them mate. So the sire bull mates with calves that are from another cow that he has mated with previously. And I keep saying mating with calves, but that's not what I mean, mating with heifers. They'd be at the point where they're ready to mate. My, my cow terms are not on point, and Kay's not here with me today to correct them. So if I slip one through, you know what I mean. Okay, so without trying to find wrong with what I'm saying here, let's just understand. I mean when a bull meet, mates with a heifer that is a descendant of his, that is inbreeding. Uh, and that can be considered line breeding too. When they decide to take a bull and breed him to his own calves that are, are from his line, that's line breeding. And breeders will do this on purpose because what you're doing is you're magnifying certain traits that are in that line. If you have a bull uh, that has a trait that you like, this trait of his it's a, something you can actually genetically breed for. Well, if I breed him to another cow that is one of his daughters, we'll keep using the word daughter, just a basic layman term here, um, that could concentrate that trait that we like and really make it strong. And that can happen. Uh, but you can also do things really bad, which is what Terry Beth was talking about. Things can go bad when you line breed or inbreed uh, because you can concentrate good traits and you can concentrate the bad ones, which is why generally you avoid this with cattle, uh, with dogs, <laughs> certainly with humans. Now, wh who should avoid? Is it never a good idea? Like Terry Beth said, well, I don't think you can say that because there are breeders out there. This is what they do. This is their full-time thing. They are very knowledgeable. They have seen how this works and they can develop a plan with some line breeding uh, to really pronounce this one trait and they've tested to make sure there's no bad things that are hidden in there that are gonna become more pronounced and negative and then maybe after some line breeding they then take that really concentrated trait and bring it back into a new line. Uh, so if you really know what you're doing here uh, it could be a good gamble. And I use the word gamble because here's the illustration I'm gonna go with to show who should and who shouldn't do this. There are some really high stakes poker games in Vegas, uh, the World Series of Poker. You can go and play it and you can win a ton of money. You can concentrate all that money from all those people playing poker and you can win it. And if you're a really good poker player, like you do it full time, you're a master, you know how to count odds and uh, figure out if I play these cards, I have this much percentage of winning, and so I can bet up to that percent against my current pot. If you're that good, then sure, go ahead and play in the World Series of Poker because while things could go badly for you, you have a better chance of things going good for you and actually winning some money. If you just play poker on a Friday night with some buddies and you know, you just like, once in a while you like to bluff and it's fun and you have no idea about card percentages and learning how to weight your hand and uh, figuring out how much you're actually supposed to bid based off the percentage of you know you actually making the the winning hand there if it's just a hobby thing for you then you probably should avoid going to the world series of poker because you're probably going to come out a loser and i think that's the best way to illustrate whether or not you should decide to line breed your livestock. If it's your full-time thing and you know what you're doing, you know more about it than me. So you're not even interested in my opinion and you can do it and good things can happen. So I think Terry Beth, uh, by saying it's never a good idea, I think that's not exactly true. 
But if it's just your hobby thing, you do it on Friday night, you know, you take your livestock and it's a weekend thing, probably shouldn't line breed because you probably don't know what you're doing and you're probably going to cause problems. Now, ready for this? There's always, there's always a way to make something I say not true and here it is. If you're just breeding to create a meat cow that you're going to eat. So my example here, ladybug, let's say she has a bull calf. After she's bred successfully, she has a bull calf. And now we have this bull calf. If the next calf we're going to have from ladybug, we are planning on eating, male, female, whatever, we need some beef, we're going to eat this one. Uh, I'm not saying we would do that, but if that were the case, if we were just breeding her to get her bread so she would be back in milk and whatever came out of her we were going to eat, yeah, then sure. It's no big deal to line breed because whatever comes out you're going to eat anyway, so no big deal. Now, if you're looking for the perfect, you know, calf to come out with the perfect quality meat, and like, then no. But if you're just making something to eat, then yeah, go for it. And that's why with like chickens or ducks, I don't really pay much attention if there's line breeding or inbreeding going on in the chickens or the ducks. If they're not going to be my breeding stock, if we're just raising them to have some eggs and then eat them, it's not a big deal. Good, good question. Brenda, I think what you're dealing with, I don't know what your plans are. Um, but I wonder if it was like, I feel like you, you feel like it was probably not the best idea, even though it was easier. And I, I think I agree with you, Brenda. I don't think line breeding, when you come at it from the approach you have of just like, well, it's convenient. I don't think it's the best idea, but is it going to be a huge problem? I have no idea because I have no experience with line breeding. <laughs> How's that for honesty? City Girl Country Heart wants to know if Ladybug is pregnant, would you prefer a male or a female calf? And that is an easy question. We don't want to eat her calf. We want it to be a heifer calf, female, and we want to keep breeding them. When you have dairy animals, it's very rare that you actually want a male. Unless you have really good quality and you're planning on using him as a sire, but we are not. So at a homestead level, you always want girls, if they're dairy animals. I know someone's gonna be like, you don't always want it, sometimes you want meat. I know, it's just, for the most part, it's nice to have females. Speaking of homesteading, great question from Tony. I have been looking at land. I noticed you have a spot that is a little hilly. Hmm, it's a little hilly. Are you comfortable with the way the land is? Also, what type of land slash property would be the sweet spot? Giggle. I know I will need to have an area on the land that is fairly flat for the home and barn if there isn't one already standing. Given the choice, would you place the home and barn on top of a hill to be able to watch over your animals? If there was a creek or a stream on the property, would, could, would you consider filtering the water to water your animals and garden? The land slash properties I've been considering are in the east area with less harsh winters. Of course, those have mountains. What are your thoughts? So good question, Tony, and a huge question. Could make a great video on this one day we will. Uh, but I want to address the specific things you asked for. So what would I look at homestead land? A homestead is different from a farm, which we will talk about in the future, in a question coming up soon. Um, a homestead, you're not trying to do huge crop acreage, right? You're not doing just like acres and acres of corn. Uh, generally speaking on a homestead, you're not doing tons of livestock grazing. So even the giant field we have here, as you can see from this week, from mowing and things, um, we have not used it all. I keep talking about the mowing video. I think that actually comes out next week. So if you haven't seen the mowing video I keep talking about, forgive me, I have my timeline a little next, mixed up. Uh, the point is you don't need a big, flat, huge, wide open space. Hilly is okay for a homestead. There's actually a lot of reasons why a hill is nice, depending on what you're planning on. Um, I like the property we're on here, the hilly factor. I don't like where we're located on the hill per se because we've had a very wet year and there has been a ton of runoff off the mountain and as a lot of you have seen our barns kind of right at the base so we get a big puddling in front. Now it's been a record wet year uh, and there has been some changes to the driveway that we need to kind of fix so that it runs off a little better. But um, I wouldn't avoid a hill 
our squash hollow farm was located on a nice ridge and that was really nice we we're kind of built into the hillside so some of the benefits of being on a hilly property you have a natural barrier so that natural barrier can help keep animals kind of more contained naturally just the hill is going to keep them from going too far you don't have to worry about neighbors with the hill behind you you're not going to see neighbors which is always nice if you do in a homestead the less people you got to see the better a, a, a hill or a ridge can create some really good microclimates for different plantings or different animals. If you're on a south facing hill, uh, depending on the pitch, that pitch of your hill can it be like moving more south because the pitch catches the sun more and just having some pitch to your south facing slope, it's like moving a whole state more south. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, uh, but if you do, if you have a, a nice pitched hill you can plant some things that might not do well normally on a flat land in your zone but because of the hill uh, will do better another thing that hills are good for is water catchment a hill is naturally going to catch and and send water now in our instance it's a bad thing but if we had designed our hillside to maybe catch it and run it into a containment pond where it could be absorbed into the ground we could hold on to some of the water a little bit better so that's not a bad thing um, I, I don't discourage looking at hilly ground another reason why hilly is going to be good you can be sure that a property that is very ridgy and hilly uh, has not been treated conventionally with conventional agriculture practices so if you're trying to avoid land that has been treated uh, with you know uh, pesticides and herbicides you don't have to worry about it on hilly ground if that's something you're looking for because nobody's going to plant a cornfield on a ridge. <laughs> so there are some serious pros. Now there are cons to the hill. You can't use the hilly ground the same way you would flat ground. It's harder to fence and work with livestock on hills depending on the livestock. Uh, just general access to your property can be more challenging if you don't have roads put in on the hill. However, I feel like for homesteaders who aren't trying to use tons of acreage, generally speaking, have a ridge in the back or a hill in the back is kind of nice. Uh, especially if you're a hunter and a forager and you like to get out in the woods more. You have your homestead at the base and then you go up into the hill and ridges are really good for hunting. So a lot of times deer will travel on ridges and hills. So that's a benefit to it. Um, so yeah, don't avoid ridges or hills they will be worth less to a farmer and farmland, so they will cost less, so there's another benefit. Uh, sometimes they will be taxed less. If you are agriculturally taxed, they will value ridges less, and so you will pay less for that land. That was the case in Squash Hollow. Uh, we were agriculturally taxed for our land, and we paid less because the value was less because it was a ridge and not a big flat piece of corn ground that we weren't gonna grow corn in. So think like a homesteader, not like a farmer, if you're gonna homestead, and kind of think about, well, you know what, I can get a nicer piece with a lot of wildlife, and it's a beautiful scenic thing, and I can kind of sneak off into the hillside and do some hunting, uh, and it's gonna be cheaper than the same 100 acres if it's big and flat and prime growing space for a farmer. So there's that. Now you ask about uh, you want to build on flat land for the home and barn. Yeah, that's true. It's nice to have a little flat area to build your home and barn. And if if you're doing that, try to plan the hill and the barn so that you don't wind up flooding your barn. Uh, our property here, the barn's right at the base, but it's also a hill on the other side. So we didn't have anywhere else. To, it couldn't have been put anywhere else. Uh, the things we're going to have to do is just work on our slopes and try to point water in different directions, which is possible with some earthworks. We just haven't got around to it, okay? But as far as using that water, talking about filtering a, a creek or a stream and giving the animals that water and using it in the garden, if it's a flowing stream or creek, you don't really have to worry about filtering it for your animals or for your garden. I wouldn't drink it myself unless I knew the source to be clean. But a flowing stream out of a beautiful eastern ridge, I mean, your animals can drink that no problem. The thing you have to worry about more than your animals drinking it is getting it to the animals without the animals getting in it. Uh, when animals get into water sources, 
they, that causes problems for everybody. For the water sources, you can cause algae blooms because the animals get poop in the water, which fuels the algae, and poof, now you got a big green pond in your backyard. Uh, so traditionally, if you have livestock, your uh, the, the good thing to do is to fence them out of that water system, and then, like you mentioned, bring it to them. So I wouldn't worry about filtering it for the livestock or for the animals as much. What I would worry about is actually just keeping them out of it and getting it to them. Don't let your cows go drink out of the stream. It's bad for erosion, it's bad for the water, it's bad for the people downstream of you, it's bad for you, it's bad for everybody. So don't do that. Uh, keep the cows and the animals out of the water and away from that and then put a pump in the stream or set up a system to gravity feed yourself and uh, get it to the animals that way. And that can be really nice. It is nice to have water on a property. Uh, Squash Hollow, we had it across the street and I wished so bad it was on our side. Because if you think about it, in a power outage or if something really bad were to happen, if there's water on your property, there's water on your property. You don't have to worry as much about planning for bad, bad things happening as if there is no water on the property. I know that doesn't answer all your question. That's a topic for a video that we should plan on doing in the future because it's a great question. But I hope it points you in the right direction for some of what you were asking. One last question we're gonna cover in this one. I, I had to get this one in because this is such a good question. Uh, Bill Rutledge, Ask Homesteady, could you give your definitions of homestead, farm, ranch? Bill, I have no experience with ranching. Um, I don't have a very good understanding of what's involved in ranching. So I'm not even going to go there with ranching. I'm going to just talk about homesteading and farming. Uh, because there is, of course, the internet debate about this. And people can get heated up. I, I get comments once in a while that I just have to laugh at because I'm like, oh man, oh, to be able to like take time during my day to get all worked up about this and leave a comment on somebody's channel, like to have that be my problems in life, that would be pretty nice. But <laughs> we're gonna talk about it here. Uh, some people get mad when I mention, when I talk about our farm. You don't have a farm, you're not a farmer, you're not farm. Farmers are doing way more work than you and you're just a city boy who doesn't know what he's doing and uh, it's just a hobby, it's not a farm, idiot. So first off, let me just lead by saying, uh, if you use, if you have 10 chickens and two little goats in a garden and you like to call it your little backyard, your farm, awesome. Like, if you wanna go for like the definition, if you want to get all googly on me. Farm, an area of land and its buildings used for growing crops and rearing animals, typically under the control of one owner or manager. Boom. Like if you want to get all googly, there. that's very simple. <laughs> if you have 10 chickens and you're growing a garden, like you can call it a farm, it's okay. Now, I don't generally use the word farm to describe that. We'll talk about what I generally use the word, um, the words to describe. Because I, I do think it's helpful to understand when you talk about what you're actually meaning. Uh, but what I'm saying is, just before we get into this, don't get all worked up because you think it's not a farm and someone else does or vice versa. Like, if someone wants to call their farm, if they have 10 chickens in a garden and they, and they call it, you know, our family farm, like good for them. They're doing what the definition said. They can call it a farm. And a homestead, in my opinion, is, is very similar because the homestead, where it comes from, that word homestead, if you read the definition of the word homestead, it's confusing. So the, the, again, if you're getting all googly here, the definition homestead, a house, especially a farmhouse, and outbuildings. Uh, right, that doesn't mean much of anything. North American Historical, provided by the Federal Homestead Act of 1862, an area of public land in the West, granted to the citizens of the U.S. who were going to settle and farm it for at least five years. Um, an agricultural and suburban city in, oh, Florida, <laughs> never mind. So anyway, again, if, if you're going for the strict definitions, they're not really helpful. So... If you want to call your place a homestead or a farm, 
If you have some animals, if you're growing stuff, cool, call whatever you want. Like, that's fine. Now, what do I, when I talk about a farm or a homestead, what do I generally use for my own kind of gauge on where I use those words? I, I look to the history of the Homestead Act, because I think most of us who call ourselves homesteaders are kind of hearkening back to that time where uh, people moved out west. And what were those people doing? They were going to get free land. They still had to pay uh, registration for that land, so they still had to put out some money for it, but the land was gonna be essentially free once they had paid for the, red, the, uh, the filing and everything if they could live off of that large acreage for five years. So they had to farm the land, develop the land, and live off of the land for five years. Would they have sold some of their produce as a business? Absolutely. Would they, did they have to? No, they had to survive off the land. So today, when we're talking about homesteaders and farmers and like what's the difference, generally the way I describe those two different things, um, I kind of focus on what is the goal of the property, not what does it look like and what is how big is it and how much do you have? Because again, the f definition of a farm, I mean, technically it could have 10 chickens and a raised bed and technically you're there at the definition. So I usually look at a farm as something that's more commercially driven and I usually look at a homestead as something that's more about self-sufficiency and self-reliance uh, and, and production for oneself, fo it being the focus. Not to say either can't do either, but let's talk about the focus. So a farmer versus a homesteader. Uh, here we have Farmer Ost. He owns 100 acres. Uh, so what does Farmer Ost do? Well, he wants to make a living off of this property that he has. So what does he do? Uh, he figures out the local market. What is there a niche that he could fill? Um, well, look at that. There's a, a hole where grass-fed beef should be at the local farmer's market. And I got this beautiful, huge field up there. Uh, I could rotate a nice mix of grass-fed beef out of there. Uh, and then I have winters to think about. So you know what? while I'm rotating them, I can cut some of my hay, so I better get some hay equipment. This is my business after all, so I can spend the money on $50,000 worth of haying equipment. It's a business write-off, and I will make up for that in what I sell in grass-fed beef. And so I'm, st I'm doing a crop, which is hay, and I'm doing uh, meat, which is beef. So that's all I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm not gonna own chickens because I don't have time to take care of chickens. Now my daughter wants to have a couple egg laying chickens so I have a little coop in the back where my daughter goes and sells her farm fresh eggs. Uh, but I, I do two things here on this family farm, grass fed beef and hay and that I make a living from. Now I don't make a ton of money because farming. So my wife is a doctor and she makes good living and we get benefits from that. And this, I work the land and help us to stay on this family farm that we've owned for the last, you know, 100 years. We make some money from it. It pays for itself. It is profitable. But good thing my wife is a doctor because we also make money from that. And we get our benefits taken care of and all those things. This property, all the decisions I make is commercially focused. I don't raise chickens because I don't have a chicken business. I'm not trying to feed my family all my own food. I only eat so much meat. To tell you the truth, I don't eat much meat because I sell it all and I don't eat any hay. So most of my groceries, I go and buy. I eat a couple nice steaks a year, you know, a couple prime ribs that I don't sell at the farmer's market, but everything else I go and buy and uh, because I'm just focused on selling meat and hay. That's what I do off of this farm. There's Farmer Ost. He is working a farm, he's focused commercially, making decisions based off of what makes sense commercially because this is his business and it's okay that his wife has another job. Maybe he even has a part-time job doing something else. That's okay, all the decisions are focused commercially off of their, their farm's exports. Now, let's talk to Homesteader Ost. Homesteader Ross has the same 100 acres, 
but he does not do this full time. He doesn't do it. It does a kind of part time hobby. I love eating the best quality food I can put on my table. I love eating the best bacon I can have. I love farm fresh eggs. I love, love, love chicken and, and roast duck. I like venison, foraging wild mushrooms. Ooh, I love all this different stuff. Uh, so I have 100 acres here. You know what I'm going to do with this 100 acres? I'm going to raise two head of beef each year because I like good beef. I'm going to raise a couple goats. I like goat cheese. And my wife kind of wants to try making goat cheese. Uh, so I'll put a couple goats up there. I'm definitely going to get a chicken coop full of chickens because I love farm fresh eggs. And I love meat chickens. So good. I love all that stuff and I can do it all. I don't have too much of any animal so I can have a lot of different animals. I'm covering almost all my family's food. I got a couple raised beds that I work. So that's like my kitchen garden. I got fresh herbs out of there, tomatoes. I make a great salsa every year because I love to can. Um, and then when the fall comes and all my harvest is done, I go up in the hills with my rifle and my bow and arrow. I shoot a couple deer, shoot a couple wild birds, a couple of pheasants, maybe some ch uh, quails or whatever else I find out there. Uh, in the springtime, I get a couple of turkeys off the property. I have a nice field in the back. I just mow the field because it brings in the wildlife and I don't have enough animals to keep up with it. Um, but I just do a little bit of everything. And you know, actually, I really like pigs. So every year, instead of raising just two pigs, my pen's big enough, I raise four of them. And I sell the extra bacon to my friends and family because I already have the pigs. I have everything set up. I'm taking them to the butcher. And when I take the two extra pigs to the butcher, that pays for my two pigs feed for the year and covers the expenses of my chicken too. Same with the beef. I raise two because one I sell to friends and family and that pays for my own beef. So pretty much my property is self-sufficient as much as possible. I still have to buy a lot of inputs. I buy feed and I buy seeds, but I'm raising most of the meat that my family eats, a lot of the veggies, and it's profitable in that while my time is not covered in the equation, the food on my table is paid for through the little bit extra that I sell to friends and family, and I don't have to spend any time at a farmer's market sitting all day long on Saturday. I get to go hunting on Saturday because I'm just selling a couple extra products to friends and family nearby. When you look at Farmer Austin, Homesteader Austin, do you see how my definition is focused on their production, their goals, and why, right? Farmer Ost is focused on commercial growth. He wants to make a living from the land, full-time or majorly part-time. So he doesn't have a little bit of every animal because that would be a horrible way to make money. He has one or two big exports, hay and beef. He can really streamline those. He can focus on that. He doesn't care that he has to buy chicken at the supermarket. He's making enough money from his cattle operation to buy his groceries. His goal is not to be feeding his family the best quality meat and self-sufficiency. His goal is to make a living from the land that his family has owned. It's great. It's awesome. That's Farmer Ost. Homesteader Ost, he has a lot of different things going on. It's kind of a hobby. He enjoys a lot of it. It's probably not actually profitable, but it's paying for itself in various ways. He has a lot of different stuff because unlike Farmer Ost, Homesteader Ost wants to have that variety. He likes to have a lot of different things to enjoy. And Homesteader Ost can do that because it's not, doesn't have to pay for its, it doesn't have to be profitable. It can pay for itself. It could not pay for itself because it's a hobby and he just has fun doing it. He makes different decisions based off of his circumstance. So farmers, in my mind, when I use the words farm and homestead, for the most part, I'm thinking about someone who's commercially driven for someone who's kind of self-sufficiency production driven. But again, you're going to see in lots of my videos off the tip of my tongue, I use the two kind of crisscross. I talk about our farm. It is a farm. You saw the googly definition. This is a farm. Is it a farm business? Is it something that I'm doing full-time? No, but by the definition, technically, yeah, you can call this a farm. Do I mean farm when I talk about this place? Usually I'm more talking about a homestead. 
And you out there, if you're focused on feeding your family and learning new skills and trying to be a little more self-sufficient, you probably have what's more like a homestead, what the homesteaders would do back in the 1800s. Do you sell a couple things off that homestead? Sure. That doesn't mean you're not a homestead. That doesn't mean you're like a full-time farmer now. You just got a surplus and you can sell a little bit. When you start to focus more on the commercial side of things, in my opinion, that's where you become more like a farm. Squash Hollow was a farm. We had a gross of $5,000 or more every year from farming, from meat. And pigs was that one major export. That's why I did so many pigs every year, because that was our farm export. And by the definition of the state, by the tax code, and by googly, it was a farm. This here, while a bigger piece of property and could be a bigger farm, in my opinion is more like a homestead because I don't have the same goals here to raise and export as a farmer, whereas at Squash Hollow when I first started, I did. So ironically, I feel like Squash Hollow, while smaller, was more like a farm. And here, while much bigger and capable of doing a lot more, we have more fancy equipment, I don't really think that's what makes a farm. I think it's your goals and what you're trying to do. That's just my opinion. I'd love to hear what you all think in the comments below. Farm, homestead, what do you think makes a difference? Uh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> that is it for Ask Homesteady today. And uh, thank you for all your questions. If you like this show and you want to help us keep doing it, there is a very easy way to do that. I shouldn't say easy, but there's a good way to do it. And that is to do all your shopping through amsteady.com. If you're going to shop on Amazon, try to make it part of your team. When you type in Amazon, type in Amsteady instead in the URL bar, and it will forward you to Amazon. And we get a uh, like 7% bonus depending on what you purchase from that. So that, that really helps us do the show. If you spend $100, we get $7. And if 100 people do that, we'd make $700. That would be incredible. Uh, it helps us do the show full time. If you like seeing these videos five days a week, every day, boom, out the video. Uh, if it's worth it to you to come and watch every day, uh, then please, if you do Amazon shopping, do it through Amstudy because it has made a huge difference in us being able to do this show. And if you really love this show and you want to make sure it never stops because we're like, well, we got to do something else because it's not paying the bills, <laughs> uh, you can become a Homestudy Pioneer. There's a link below for that. It comes out to a quarter per episode. If every video you watch of ours, you just get a smile on your face. You're like, oh, I love this channel. This is my daily YouTube channel, and I just sit here and enjoy 20 minutes of homesteading. If it's worth a quarter to you, bing, keep the change. Uh, you do that in one payment, boom, five bucks a month by becoming a homesteady pioneer. And in return, you gain access to bonus content, uh, classes I used to teach at local schools about small farming, um, other people teach classes. I have uh, a culinary educator, what's the word, a culinary instructor teaching about food preservation, and uh, my pig guy that I used to buy pigs from every year teaching a whole thing on pigs, and uh, just some really good experts out there helping in areas like gardening. There's a good lesson in gardening. I couldn't possibly make a class on gardening, but there's one in there from an expert. So you gain access to all that by becoming a pioneer. And we thank you so much. We could not do the show without you pioneers. Plus, you can get discounts on homesteading stuff. There's a whole lot. Check it out. Click on the link below. And we'll see you in next week's videos.